Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where I write a game engine from scratch. Today is the day we finally start working on the game engine itself, uh, the engine project in our solution. So far we only have been programming for the editor part, which has been fun, but I am really looking forward to start programming for the game engine itself because it's a game engine programming series. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, let's get rid of all these files. At least I just close them. We don't need them anymore. The first thing I would like to do is to go through the properties of this project and see if there are any options that I need or want to change uh, for this project to be optimally configured. Uh, so in debug build, uh, these seem to be okay. It's a library, it's using the latest uh, installed version of the Windows SDK. And the tool set is okay. And the advanced settings. In the C, C++ options, I'll just view all options. I don't want to go through all of these subcategories. Uh, I can view them in one go. That is easier. So let's see, there are no additional include directories yet. I'll probably have to add one later on to have like a central location for the include files. These are all okay. The language standard that I'm going to use is C++ 17. I'm not going to use the latest because some of those have some kind of breaking changes that they could change later on. And then, yeah, then we have to go back to our code and adjust that again or modify it. So I'm just using the latest stable version of the language that is implemented in Visual Studio. The calling convention. Uh, I'm going to choose fast call. The difference being that in the C dec decal, <laughs> C decal option, you push all the parameters of the uh, of the function that you are going to call. You push them on the stack, so into memory, and then the function when it starts pull pop the parameters from the stack and use them. Uh, and the fast call is is going to put as much as possible of those parameters on the registers and pass them through registers to the function that we are going to call. And using the registers is of course faster than using memory. So that's why it's called fast call. I'm not sure what the difference is between standard call and C. Uh, vector call you use for whenever you have uh, SIMD instructions and you want to pass the SIMD registers, uh, like the MMX and those kind of uh, data types, then the compiler will put those in the SIMD registers. But in general, I'm just using fast call. I'm not going to use uh, exceptions at all in the engine. So I'm going to turn them off. Uh, the enhanced instruction set, uh, I'll let the compiler decide for now which one uh, it will use. Uh, normally, I think on default, it will just pick the SS2, SSE2 instruction set. That's fine for now. Uh, I have no idea what these, this is, JCC, Eretum, Mitigation, no, 
I think that's one of those Intel defects. I don't know. I'm just leaving it like this. Uh, the intrinsic functions uh, in the debug build, I'm not bothered with these optimization things. I don't need runtime type information ever, so that's a no. I'm not going to use a lot of strings, if any at all, in this engine, so I don't really care. I have no idea what this means. No, I guess, no. <laughs> um, okay, floating point model. We are not going to do any scientific precise calculations in a game engine, so I'll just use fast. I hope that this will also do some denormal prevention uh, stuff, but I'm not sure. I have to look it up if... What I mean by the normal uh, prevention is that whenever the floating point uh, numbers get really close to zero, then the processor is going to treat them differently than uh, when they are in a normal range. So um, the processing of those kind of really small numbers is uh, slower. And uh, with this, I hope to say that whenever that happens, just treat those numbers as zeros because they are really small anyway and then just calculate as if they were zeros and uh, we have like not this high kind of precision um, calculations but we are faster uh, force conformance for loop scope I guess so I don't care uh, no XML documentation files, no, don't ignore include paths, no inline function expansions. Multi-processor compilation, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, Visual Studio is kind of slow anyway, so why not use multiple cores to compile our programs with? I remember I removed these uh, these extra platforms, so let me quickly check if it's still the case. So here in Configuration Manager, hmm. it's curious because I still have the option in in the In the project properties, I can uh, I can still select this Win32 uh, platform. Oh, here it is again. Uh, why you still have that? It's so annoying. Visual Studio is just annoying. Of course. The humankind still has to find out how to properly outline the UI elements in like a professional software uh, package that we have here. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, how am I going to... Okay. Let's try again. Go to all options and then let's see if I... Okay. I got... I managed to get rid of that Vin32 uh, platform finally. Thank God. Multiprocessor compilation, yes. Optimization is disabled for debug build. That's okay. I'm not going to use pre-compiled headers yet. So not using those. And this should then go away. Not having a pre-compiled header file. I don't think I need STL checks. We are not going to develop any security sensitive software anyway, so I'm just going to get rid of this and disable security checks. And 
if we get hacked while we're, we are playing a game that was made by this engine, then too bad. I deny any responsibility for that. Spectre mitigation, not needed. Okay, I don't care for these. Uh, unicorn, unicorn? No, Unicode <laughs> for assembler listing. So this is okay for the debug build. Uh, let's apply that and then go to release. Uh, here's the same story with those additional include like uh, include directories. Uh, no, no assembler output. Um, I'm again, using fast call. Uh, language sun standard is seventeen. Uh, I don't think we need this. No, no security needed. There's no security checks needed at least. No exceptions. Uh, function level linking. I guess that's that should be yes. Uh, intrinsic functions. Well, it depends. If it makes your code very large, then you will have a lot of cache misses in this instruction cache, and then your code will become slow. But on the other hand, if uh, you you do uh, you do a lot of calls to these intrinsic functions in tight loops, then uh, this should improve the performance. So I'm going to leave it yes for now. Yeah, parallel code generation. Yes, please. Runtime type information again, no. The floating point model should be fast again. Yes, multiprocessor compilation is good, I hope, at least. Uh, with Visual Studio, you never know. No pre-compiled headers. No security checks. I'm going to uh, have a higher level of warnings, uh, which is four. Obviously, it would give me more kinds of warnings. So apply this and go back to debug because I think I have the level. Yeah, here I should set the level warning level to level four as well. And I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, here. There aren't things that I want to set, um, so that's good. Okay, let's see what happens when I build the project now. It builds fine. Okay, the next thing I'd like to do is to get rid of these uh, files that I'm not going to use. Uh, show all files, select them all, and delete them. And I don't need these filters uh, anymore. So delete them as well. Save all. And we are set to start writing code for the engine. So um, the first... Um, the first file I want to create is a common header for uh, everything basically in the engine. Uh, oh, I created a filter accidentally. Let's delete this. Go into file mode and add 
a folder. Okay. So the difference between uh, filters and folders is that whenever I create a folder, it well, it creates a folder, but the filters are not um, created anywhere in this uh, in the folder of the engine. So all the files that we then would create would be here in the root folder, which is not good because, well, then they wouldn't be ordered in any way. So I'll just create folders and put them in there. So as I said, I want to create a new uh, header file. Actually, I want to uh, have it uh, as common headers. And here I include all the headers that I need in the uh, project. So the C++, C, C++ headers. The ones I want to start with are the standard int integer. And the assert, assertion header. Next, I want to create my own uh, types of integers. I'll at least, I'll give the different size integers their own names. So um, I'll create a file for primitive types. And here I again include uh, the standard int header. So C++ has these uh, kinds of integers, uh, like a uh, unsigned integer 16-bit type. And those are based on the native types of C++. So we know uh, what size exactly they are, which is very handy if you need integers of 32-bit length of, uh, or any other kind of integers that you really need to know what size they are. Uh, because if you use these, uh, these kind of uh, integers, like a long, long, and unsigned char or whatever, C++ originally included, or actually these are C types, right? Their size can be different on different platforms. So that's why we have uh, this now, uh, which is fine, but I think these names are a bit too long to type all the time. That's why I'm going to rename them for, for use in my own engine. So, for example, uh, I'll have the U8, the 8 bit unsigned integer, to be like this. So we have 64 bits, 32 bits, and 8 uh, and 16 bit uh, unsigned integers. And I'm going to do the same for signed integers. I'm going to use S instead of U to indicate on uh, signed. And here we can just delete the U and we have signed integers. And I want to have one for a floating point value. 
because I'm going to use these kind of integers for indices a lot of times, actually, I need a value to be reserved to indicate an invalid index. Well, indices start at zero normally, and I would like to reserve the biggest uh, value that you could fit into an integer to be an invalid value. So for example, if you look at the 8-bit unsigned integer, it's in the range 0 and 255. And I want to have this value of 255 to be the invalid uh, index. So an index that has this value is invalid. That means that we can use 0 to uh, 254. And if you look at the binary representation of um, the invalid value is uh, the eight bits are, well, eight zeros, of course. So we have one and then two and then three and then four, etc. And all the way to 255, which is just all ones or eight ones. And this also represents the value minus one. So I'm going to use minus one for all of these uh, integers to represent the invalid index value. So what I just did is that I uh, used the hexadecimal um, representation of the value minus one. So this is again all the bits set to one. Okay, um, so yeah, we are done with uh, the primitive types. I have everything I need here. Now I can also include this header to our common headers. Next, I want to start like we did for the level editor with entities and their components. But before I start working on those, I am going to explain how I'm going to implement those in the engine because they are rather different from how uh, we implemented them in the level editor. Okay, going to my drawing here. It depicts the way we implemented the entities and components in the editor, which is the object-oriented uh, way of implementing it. So uh, here we have a list of entities, and each entity has a list of components. So for example, this one, the first one has a transform, which all entities have to have. So that one is in all entities. And it has a geometry component, um, same as the second entity. But the third entity has only a transform and a script. And uh, this one, the middle one, has all four of these entities. Well, of course, there are probably going to be uh, uh, more kinds of components uh, than these four. But this is just for the illustration purposes, for the explanation. Uh, and the way we uh, retrieve any information about these components is that we just go through the list and see if it has a component of this type. For example, if you're looking for a, a geometry component in uh, an entity, then we go through its component list and check if it has a geometry component. And if not, then we return no. It works fine as long as you are not going to do a lot of 
calculations on thousands of entities every frame of your game like in the editor of course we don't do that we just do it whenever i select an entity and it's retrieved once and that's basically it but in the game engine uh, we have to process a lot of these uh, this information uh, every frame so that means at least 30 or 60 uh, times per second for possibly hundreds or thousands of entities. And that kind of just makes your CPU very sad because CPU is just sitting there waiting for the for all these memory fetches to come in and do something with one of them and then wait again for the next piece of information and then yeah it kind of gets boring for the CPU this way very fast. The way I'm going to implement these entities and their components in the engine is uh, a bit more data oriented. Um, so uh, I'm going to use indices instead of instances. So I'll have an array, for example, for the transform component. I'll have an array for that in a separate file that has all the positions and orientations and skills in the same array and then I just have an index to that array in my entity list. So that means that uh, these indices by the way start at zero so we, well, to be more precise but here they start at one, one, two, three, four. Uh, that means that whenever we have an entity that doesn't have a particular component that we then use one of those invalid indices to indicate that this entity doesn't have that component and the way we can look up components is then very easy uh, we just know that for uh, every component there is an entry in the list of components for entities so for example for geometry we know that its index is in the third slot one two three and if this third slot is minus one that means that the entity doesn't have a geometry component so uh, these are also all 32-bit unsigned integers and yeah this is a bit or actually quite faster to process than the object-oriented uh, method but there is still room for improvement. Uh, right now, if we would implement it like this, then we would have a list of components like transform and then script ID and then geometry ID and rigid body. And then we would repeat that in the next entity. So then the transform IDs would be alternated by three other indices or at least three other indices. And that introduces a lot of cache misses as well. So to make a further improvement, I would do the following. Uh, here was the first idea of data-oriented design. And I could do the same, but then give each kind of in each type of index their own array. So if I am only looking for geometry IDs, I can just go through this array of uh, geometries and without involving any other uh, element in between two indices. So that would be even faster. And yeah, that's how I'm going to uh, implement uh, the entity and and components here and the entity basically is just a list of indices now it's not a, even a class or anything like that and that makes your cpu go super saiyan and before i start implementing the entity and components i would like to explain something more about the indices that i'm going to use imagine that we have this list of entities entity information in some kind of array and and each 
slot has an index. So here in the second slot, we have entity number two. It's sitting here being happy. And there is an object somewhere in our game engine or in the game code that refers to this uh, element. But at some point, we are going to delete this entity and uh, later on, we'll add another entity that will sit in the same slot because we are, of course, reusing these slots to save space on the memory. And now this reference to this entity isn't valid anymore because if this object would ask for the information of this entity, it will get the information from the new entity and not the old one. So it will have... Uh, for example, if you would ask for an for a geometry component, it will it would get the geometry of the new entity, which could be a mountain instead of an apple, uh, which would have been the the old entity. So that's a problem. And to solve this, I'm going to slice each index into two parts: a small part of it. For example, 8 bits of it, or maybe 10 bits, depending on how often we are going to uh, remove and add new entities. That part I'm going to use as a generation part, and the rest of the index is the index into this array. And each time we put another entity here, I'll just increment the generation. So for example, for this new entity, I'll have the generation one because it was zero first. And now it's a new generation. And if you would remove this one and add another one, then the generation would become two. But the index would uh, stay the same because it's still in the second uh, in the second slot of the array, right? This way, if we now, if our object would request information about uh, about the entity in this uh, index, then we could compare their generations to each other and determine if uh, we are talking about the same entity. Now, because of this mismatch, we can infer that this uh, object has an old has a reference to an old entity, and we can tell it that it doesn't exist anymore and then it can handle that case uh, so yeah uh, this is the first thing I'm going to write because the indices are uh, rather important in the entity component system that I'm going to implement and it is basically uh, roughly based on uh, something I read a long time ago in a block of Stingray uh, engine. And let's see. Um, they are talking about this uh, index bits and index mask and generation bits, etc. So the way I'm going to implement this uh, index system is roughly based on their block. I'll uh, include a link to this one in the description of the video so you can read it yourself. Actually, there is a lot of very useful, interesting articles in this blog that could be really interesting to anyone who wants to learn more about game engine programming, like me. Anyway, going back to Visual Studio, now I can uh, here again add a folder. In this folder, I'll put anything again, like we did for the primal editor, uh, anything that has to do with the components and entities. But before that, I'll just add a header file for the ID, uh, ID system, index system that I just told you about. Here, I'm going to include this common header again, common headers. 
first of all, I'll just have a type name for uh, our ID uh, that we can change whenever uh, we want. So what I mean by that is I have an ID type and that's a 32-bit unsigned integer. So later on, maybe uh, like in 20 years, when we have a need for more than 4 billion uh, entities, we can change that to like 64 or a 64 bit. So that would work. Or maybe some people would like even 16 bit to preserve memory. That is also good. So we can change the type of our indices like this. And then I am going to say, okay, how, how many bits of this index I want to reserve for that generation part. So right now I'm going to reserve eight bits for it, but we could also use six or 10, uh, depending on what you're comfortable with. Because this generation, if it's at eight bits, that means that if we would do this removing an addition of new entities like 255 times, then this would wrap around and become zero again. And then in that case, if at that moment someone would ask for this index of 0, 0, 0, 0002, then they would still get an invalid or the wrong entity. So that's extremely unlikely to happen, but if you are not comfortable with that, you could use more than eight bits. And for example, if you would use 10 bits, then th uh, this uh, chance of a bug happening would happen every uh, 1,024 uh, refreshments of this slot, if uh, you understand what I mean. I hope. Um, so yeah, that's why I want to make that configurable as well. Okay, next is the index bit. And that's just how many bits the ID type has minus the bits that we reserved for generation bits. And then I'll have a mask for these uh, parts. So we can, we can, for example, get rid of the generation part and then have only the index. So we can uh, go into our arrays for that index and retrieve information. Therefore, we need these masks. And uh, if I only need the generation bits, then I'll have a mask for index bits that would get rid of the index and the other way around is as I have an index for generation bits that would get off the generation part and leave me with the index. Well, I am really sorry. I was I forgot to zoom in the code <laughs> all this time. So it might have been a bit difficult to read up until now, but uh, now it should be okay. I apologize for that. I uh, the Visual Studio sometimes has difficulty remembering my settings. But that doesn't mean that I can be less careful. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's see, everything is okay now. All right. So what I did here was to shift one bit to the right. So for example, if we would have, we had a four, uh, four bit Type ID, it should be uh, like this. We have 
uh, four bits and maybe one bit of generation type. So we would have an index bits bits of three. So if you would shift one, 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 two, three, like this, and then subtract one from it, this binary uh, value would become zero, one, one, one. And this gives us exactly the mask that we need to isolate the index. So we can have an index ID and this value. And the generation part, whatever it is, will, uh, because it's ended by zero, it will become zero. And then we are just left with the index part. And I can do the same for the generation mask. And I need to know what indicates an invalid ID type. Remember, we have these, uh, these types of uh, invalid indices. I could use something like, because we are using a 32-bit type ID, I could use these. Uh, oh, I need to change this. I could use this 32-bit um, invalid ID. But uh, beforehand, we, of course, we don't know how big our ID type is, right? So I still can use minus one for this. And this gives me like an invalid ID for uh, any, any type of uh, type, uh, ID type. So you can see here now that's uh, four, 4 billion something. And that means that all the bits are set. And if I would change this to 64 bit, for example, then this also would change to some big number. And for 16 bits, it would become 64K basically. And for 8 bits, it is. Uh, char. Well, <laughs> okay. Now I also need to uh, to have a generation type because I'm going to remember the generation in the generation indices sometimes in an in a separate array as well. And then I need to know in what integer type I can save a generation. Okay, so to determine what is the smallest integer type that I can use to fit this amount of generation bits in it, I'm uh, using something called a conditional. And a conditional is very simple, actually. There is nothing magic about it. First, I'm going to look up in which header it is defined, so I can uh, include that. So I think I can use type info for that, for now. Um, so what this actually is, is just two uh, structures, a template type 
Okay, this is basically what it does. Um, this is a template with three uh, template arguments, a condition and two types. And if the condition is uh, true, well, for any condition that's not false, then the compiler will pick this one. And since it's a Boolean, it's only uh, it's it will only pick this one if it's true. Because we have a template specialization for whenever it's false, and then it will pick uh, the second implementation, which returns this second type. And then what this conditional T does is that it just uh, takes the type. Uh, so we can actually look at the code here, and uh, it's these three things. So again, there is like a test and if the test is not false then the compiler will pick this one which returns the first type and the second type is returned only when this test is false and the conditional t will give you uh, this part so we don't have to type this uh, every time so now uh, I can remove this and then We have the generation type U8 because 8 bits fit in a 8 bit unsigned integer. If we would reserve 10 bits for generation bits, then we see that generation type is now a U16. So that's good. And then I would like to check a couple of things before. Uh, we start working on the rest of this ID uh, system. First of all, if uh, the generation type requires more bits than it's in generation bits, then that's good. Uh, it shouldn't have less bits than generation bits, of course. And that can happen if we increase generation bits to above uh, 32 bits. Uh, because then we will require a more, a bigger integer. But since our biggest integer is 64 bits, that means that we can't have, like every time if we go to more bits, then our size of the generation type doubles. So it goes from U8 to 8, U16 to U32. And the next one is U64. But the biggest index type that we can have is U64. And if 64 bits of that is only generation bits, then we can't use it, right? Um, so yeah, the biggest generation part that we can ha have is 32 bits or actually 31 bits so that's why I, I use this assertion the next assertion that I want to uh, use is whether uh, the generation type is not the same size as uh, the index type because it uh, it needs to be smaller obviously otherwise it would uh, it would be the whole index okay now I can go ahead and uh, write the methods that I need uh, for this to work the first method that I want to write is uh, one to check if my ID is valid. So this ID uh, is valid if it's not minus one. And the next method is to get the index part of the, uh, the ID. 
So this masks the uh, the ID and gives only the index part of it. The next one is to get the generation. For, for this to work, we first need to shift uh, the ID uh, to the left. So we are only, only left with the generation bits and then mask them. Okay, and uh, whenever I want to inc increment the generation part, I can uh, write a method to do just that. So here I get the generation of the ID and add one to it. And then I assert that it's uh, smaller than 255 because otherwise we would wrap around and then, well, we could, if someone asks for this ID again, then it wouldn't be correct, like I, I explained before. And then now we have the new generation and we shift it back to its place in the in the whole id and are that together to have a new id uh, so for example we have the generation one and then id index part is one this first line will well this function here the generation We'll shift this uh, this first one all the way to the right. So we have three index bits in this example. So it will be here. This is what it this part gives back. And then we add one to it, so it will become two. And now uh, this part will shift it back with three index bits. So this digit two will go back to its place. And the index of the original ID um, will be odd with that. So we are left with this ID now. I hope that's a bit uh, clear uh, with my explanation. Okay, now uh, I am ready to start uh, working on uh, entities and components. So first, uh, I'm going to add a new uh, header for the entity. Okay, here, instead of adding these common headers, I'll have a shared header in the components folder because I'll need this uh, ID header in, in the components and entities, but I don't need it to be in the common headers because not everything in the engine will use uh, this ID part. So here, I'm going to add a new item. And this will include the common headers. And the ID. As you can see, it can't find those folders because, well, obviously they are in a different folder. And uh, so what I can do is to add this folder to additional include directories in the properties. And uh, I can't see my C++ 
options anymore because I don't have a C++ file. Uh, Visual Studio can't figure out that this is a C++ project if I don't have a C++ file in it. Although I created this project as a C++ library. So uh, anyway, I can add, to solve that problem, I can add a new CPP file uh, for our entities. And now if I go back to my properties, I can see the properties for C++. And in additional uh, include directories, I can set uh, the project directory. So this is the project directory and here is the common folder. So that folder will be an include directory that all uh, CPP files or header files can refer to. Apply and I should do that for the release as well. I know you can see that these files can be found and are included here. So uh, now I can go ahead and in entity header uh, include the components common. This is the header for entity and I want to have two methods to create entities and uh, remove game entities. So this um, is the initialization information for my game entity. And for that, I'll have an struct. And herein, I'll have all the information that we need to create a game entity. And for removing a game entity, I'll have a remove game entity method. So this first one, the create game entity, will give me an index to the array of game entities. And because I'll have all kinds of indices for different kinds of components as well as for entities, I want some kind of differentiation between these uh, indices. Otherwise, I can mistakenly give an index or a component to this remove function. And for that, I can uh, create a typed index. So going back to this ID header, I want to have something that differentiates between IDs in the debug build and uh, reduce to U32 uh, type or the ID type in the release build. So if we are in debug build, I'll have a base uh, class or yeah base structure for our id types Okay, so here I have an ID base and its constructor just accepts an ID of type ID type. In our case, is that a 32 bit unsigned integer and it puts it in its private field to remember it. And uh, whenever I want to have it back in the form of ID type, uh, then I can have an implicit conversion operator for that. 
So whenever I have something like, okay, um, some type of ID that's uh, in, that inherits from this ID base, for example, an ent entity ID, and I have a U32, I can just do this. And then it's, this would use this operator to give me back the ID type. Now I'm going to create a macro that we can use to inherit from this uh, base ID type. But first, uh, in case we are just building in release mode, I can define it for that case. So if we use this macro to create an um, entity ID, then this entity ID type will be the same as ID type in release mode. In debug mode, however, I'm going to define that differently. I'm going to define it to inherit from this uh, ID base. Okay, uh, so here in my macro, I'll inherit from this ID base. And uh, I have two constructors, one with an argument that will uh, pass to the base. And the second one is uh, one without a parameter. And that one just initiates its member variable with an invalid index. Now I can go here in uh, components common, then here I can define my ID for the entities. And I'm putting it here instead of in the entity header because I know that my components will need the ID of their owner to know to whom they belong. So they need to know what kind of ID the entities are using. Okay, now we have a type of ID that's specific for our game entities. So uh, now I can see that it's in the wrong namespace. It's in primal ID. Uh, so that this is not correct. Uh, that's because I forgot to end this internal namespace here. So I can do this. And now it should be correct. Yeah, so it's now in primal game entity namespace. So I can put this in their own namespace of game entity. And now instead of having U32, I can have it return an entity ID. And likewise, I can use an entity ID here And I can have one more method to tell if an entity is alive. And that's basically the comparison of generations that I was talking about before. So if this ID has the same generation as the slot where this entity is in, then it's alive. 
before I implement these methods, I also need to know what is in this entity info that I can use to create an entity. And uh, therefore, I'm going to also add a, a transform component. So we have something, some example of a component to work with. So again, here I'm going to have two methods to create and remove transform components. Again, because the creation function will return an ID, I need to define a typed ID for my transform component. So here I use an initialization information structure for this transform and I'll tell this function what entity this transform component belongs to. And this initialization information is another structure that contains the, the information for the transform component. So this structure contains uh, three floating point uh, numbers for position, a rotation quaternion. That's why it's uh, four components because qu quaternions have four components and three components for the scale with a default value of one. And well, I also need another method to, to remove a transform component. So the way I would like to, uh, to structure this creation of components is through uh, the entity. So I can include the information for all types of components in the entity info structure. So I can, for example, do something like uh, transform uh, init info. Uh, whenever I get this information in this method, I can call also the creation function for the transform and then give it the pointer to that init info. Uh, but as we see, this file doesn't know what this transform namespace is yet. Or actually, it doesn't know anything about this init info. And one way I could solve this is just to include the transform header in here. But I don't want to include all headers in all the other headers. And then it will become like a cyclic soup of headers that we don't want to have. A better solution would be to forward declare this structure. I could, uh, I know that this is in a transform namespace, like here transform, and then it's defined here. So I can forward declare it like so. Now we see that there is no problem anymore. But I don't want to type this every time I have a new component. So I'll define a macro for that as well. Okay, so here I have a new macro that is basically this. Uh, the forward declaration. So whenever I call it with, for example, transform, then it will substitute transform in here. And then we end up with the code that I just had. 
And after I have done this forward initialization, I don't need this macro anymore. So I undefine it again. So it couldn't pollute uh, anything that would include this header file. That's a good, uh, I think that's a good practice. And uh, yeah, now I am ready to go and implement these uh, methods. But that's something for the next video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.